Hey guys, on a C85. Today I'm at the Minnesota State Capitol in St. Paul, and I'm here because I've been given the honor and the privilege to interview my favorite representative, which is Representative Tony Cornish. He's the biggest voice and proponent for the Second Amendment and the author of many pro-gun laws here in Minnesota. So very excited to interview him. So why don't you come on inside with me and we'll sit down and have a chat with him. First of all, uh, what an honor to be here. <laughs> You're my favorite representative, so. Oh, thank you. Um, NSA 85, I'm here with Representative Tony Cornish. Uh, he's the biggest proponent for the Second Amendment and the strongest voice for us pro-gun people here in Minnesota. So again, it's an honor to be here. Um, I, uh, I have some questions for you about the Second Amendment and also maybe some challenging ones that I received from uh, your, uh, <laughs> I guess you could say your unofficial fan club on AR15.com, uh, which is a big gun for them. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, uh, congrats by the way, I heard you just had a grandchild, was your 12th grandchild? 11th. 11th grandchild. Hoping for 12. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see here, let's start off, uh, this is a question from a person on AR15.com. Um, was there any particular moment in your life um, when you realized the importance of the Second Amendment? Yeah, probably the most defining moment was um, in 19, I think, 75, Warren Spanis, then Attorney General, was trying to get what um, we knew as our permit to carry then, up until we changed it in the early 2000s. And that was the one we dealt with from about 75 up until the early 2000s. That was that, that they may issue, not a shall issue. And I was up in the balcony of the House of Representatives watching it get uh, voted in. And um, uh, I went out to the Washington, D.C. as part of a sportsman's policy conference working on it uh, with the NRA and other groups. So probably that was my most defining moment, seeing it get voted in by one vote and one of the legislators getting up saying, uh, well, you voted for my dairy bill, I'll vote for your gun bill. And a ridiculous statement like that thought that, you know, maybe somebody else should be involved in protecting their gun rights than these people. Very cool. How old were you at that time? Oh, let's see, 51, 61, 70, 24? 24. 24. Okay. I actually didn't get involved in politics until I actually started getting into firearms. And I'm 27 myself, and this is the first time I followed the, the bill last year with the Castle Doctrine and the right to stand your ground. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that was the first time I actually felt involved. That was the first time I wrote my representatives and stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, the uh, the new bill you're presenting, you're co-author on that bill, correct? Mm -hmm. um, why don't you tell me a little bit about that new bill? Well, what that new bill does is it goes after the bad guys instead of law-abiding citizens, and it's not really. I wouldn't call it a compromise because there's nothing um, we really compromise on. It's our own idea, the way to go after the criminals and access to guns by criminals. And so what it is, it's an increased penalty for a straw buyer. And what that would be, if somebody goes in knowingly buying a gun for somebody else, um, that would increase the penalty. And it would be even increase the penalty even further for a felony uh, if you bought it knowing that the person was going to commit a crime with it. So it would be two different levels of an increased penalty. And then it gives uh, um, time mandates, um, limits on time when you've got to get the records in from Department of Human Services or the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension or even the courts and it would uh, say you've got like 72 hours to get your information into the next check, the National Information Center. So it's, uh, it's, it's a myriad of probably 10 different policy things that go after criminals and access to guns and mental health information. I was just going to say that you're, you're fixing the access issue, not, uh, not affecting law-abiding citizens. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, now, support from law enforcement always seems very, very important on the second amount of bills or anything to do with guns. Um, does this bill have a good support from law enforcement? It does for some. No, in the background on the announcement when we held the news conference in the House steps the other day, you'd see the uh, director of the Sheriff's Association and then um, Sheriff Stanley of Hamden County, and they support it. Uh, you didn't see any chiefs of police there. There are some chiefs of police that support it, but I've always had a problem with chiefs of, police support, chiefs of police supporting any gun legislation. Mostly, I think, from the national chiefs of police um, and their influence on down, that they oppose the uh, a myriad of bills that I've had over the few years of Stand Your Ground or on case guns or uh, a number of bills like this. Um, what would be another one? Castle Doctor. And so there's a lot of formal opposition from the chiefs for some reason. Do you have any opinion as to why that is? 
Yeah, I think it's because the chiefs aren't elected. And uh, they're, uh, in some cases, I don't mean this in a derogatory way completely, but they're talking heads for political groups such as mayors and city councils. The more outstate chiefs will agree with me. In fact, the Mankato chief of police, Todd Miller, who's served in on for uh, 19 years as a chief of police, some of that, uh, or I think of that just alone in Minnesota, he served as a chief down in Texas. Now he supports uh, me in most of my endeavors and in the castle doctrines. That's good. That's good. Okay. Um, now, in various places such as YouTube, um, Facebook, which you're familiar with, uh, I've seen some comments as to people are like, you know, that's really cool about the gun stuff, that's great, but you know, why aren't we focusing on the budget or the finances and stuff like that? And maybe a lot of people don't realize that uh, the, the pro-gun people are actually in the defensive on all this. And wh why is that? Explain that. Well, we would have been satisfied just to keep the status quo as it was. Um, you know, we had at one point plan, excuse me, we at one time had a plan for um, arming teachers and a number of other things and taking away the posting of businesses. It was probably a mistake we made in the original uh, version of the uh, permit to carry. But uh, this year we hadn't introduced anything and because uh, we heard that there might be a lot of gun control bills coming. But well, we've seen approximately 16 very bad uh, anti-gun, uh, supposedly under the crime control label, come out. We decided to go just into the defensive mode and concentrate all our energy on defeating those. And it wasn't our idea, our idea to avoid the economic or the jobs or the budget um, picture. We wanted to tackle that, but we were left no choice. If we would have lost our focus and went off of these, and one of these bad things would have passed, then we'd be in deep whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I got two um, maybe a little bit more advanced questions for you. Uh, these are from some people on air15.com that are curious. Um, specifically, do you think the majority of the people here in the legislature actually believe that by increasing control on guns or making more gun laws, uh, that that will decrease crime. I mean, do you think that's something they actually believe? Well, I've thought about that question too, and um, no, I don't. But I think that um, there is a way that they hope to manage fear. In other words, they know that a lot of people in the metro area, and this has been proven, that the, 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 the gun ownership is a lot less, the hunting ethic is a lot less, and so they know that they have their voters in their districts, don't know a lot about hunting or self-defense, and it's easier to frighten those people. And it seems like they take advantage of the fear there and let them think that gun control is going to do some good when they know statistically that it's not true. And yeah, it's very much on an emotional level, too. Um, do you think it's just their justification for trying to control the populace or anything like that? Well, I think that um, you know the most dangerous thing in the world isn't a gun. It's a legislator that thinks he or she has to do something. And this is one of those cases where these legislators know when we tell them that, you know, Chicago killed more people than we did in Afghanistan in one year and they some of the strictest laws, they can't refute that evidence. You know, statistically we can show them that it makes more sense to say that where there's more guns there's less crime. Take Florida, for example, where the uh, handgun ownership is like about one in every 14 of, with a pistol permit to carry and their crime rate has dropped while their gun ownership is all time high. Even though if you confront these people with that, you know, it's like going up against a brick wall, it doesn't. So I think it's um, their voting base and it's something they feel they just have to do or respond to. I, I can only assume it's very frustrating. <laughs> yeah, totally, really frustrating. When you approach somebody with facts and you, you can't get an answer. Yeah. Um, one last question for you. Uh, kind of on a different topic, but it's one that um, has been brought up a lot online, um, very much the online uh, type generation, I guess you could say. So a lot of people um, are in support of uh, suppressors in Minnesota. And Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois are the only ones in this area that don't have it legal at all, even for hunting. Everyone else around us has it. Um, what's your stand on suppressors in Minnesota and, and the possibility of a bill ever coming up? Would you support that? Well, as you know, we made some of those suppressors for like manufacturers or testing, but not yet for private ownership. The only ones that kind of privately, you've got to get that federal permit and such. But 
Yeah, there's a number of states that do it for hunting and training and saves on the ears and uh, offends less people, those that can be offended by gunshots, whoever that would be, I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, I think it's, it's just an education process. People never thought we would get the uh, permit to carry to pass. They never believed we would get the Castle Doctrine to go through both the House and the Senate, even though it was needed by the governor. And I think you just have to lay those fears. And they've got this picture of somebody named Guido coming up behind you, head, behind you and shooting you in the head. It's very much a Hollywood thing. Yes, yeah, they call it a silencer. Yeah. But what they don't realize is that even the shot locators now can differentiate the noise of a firecracker to a muff or to an ex exhaust uh, malfunction mm -hmm. to a gunshot. So um, once we uh, convince them, like we have with statistics, that virtually no crimes are committed with, with suppressors or silencers, I think then it'll just take a matter of time. If it's not this year, it'll be two or three years down the road. It took us five years to get the permit to carry. And again, with the suppressors, it's, you know, with the facts, it's not something you just go to the store and buy. I mean, there's, it's a $200 tax stamp. There's a lot of paper uh, that has to go down to D.C. and stuff, and it's, it's a long process. So it's not something that you just go to Walmart and buy. So um, that, uh, that pretty much wraps up all my questions. I, I certainly, certainly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to, uh, to talk with me. You bet. Um, you're very easy to talk to, and this was my very first interview, so this I think went very yeah, well. So thank you very much. I uh -huh. appreciate it.